Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here on Beer Sessions Radio. And today is Tuesday, July 13th, 2022. And uh, got inspired last week by a little article uh, about Porter. So I'm kind of thirsty. So let's go around the room and introduce the guests. Start with Lou. Hey, I'm Lou Bryson. Uh, I'm in Pennsylvania. I've been writing about beer for... Wow. Uh, coming up on 30 years uh, and whiskey, not much less than that. Um, I'm the guy that wrote the article. Uh, it was a uh, it's a piece on uh, Porter versus Stout. And so we're all going to get together and talk about Porter and, and I guess drink it too. All right. And uh, Todd? I'm Todd DiMatteo and uh, I'm the head brewer and one of the owners at Good Word Brewing a Public House and we're located in uh, Duluth, Georgia. All right. So you know, with all the styles and, and, and beers that are out there, Lou, why don't you write an article about Porter? Well, i got to be honest with you. I, I wrote it because Danny asked me to, because, um, you know, that's what you do. But um, I was I was happy to do it. I was, hell, I was eager to do it. Um, Porter's always been a favorite style. Uh, I mean, some of my best beer memories actually revolve around Porter rather than IPA or lager or um, anything like that. I remember um, like essentially absorbing the news of my father-in-law's death with a, a couple of bottles of a coaching porter with uh, with his with the family, the in-laws. Um, porter. Uh, I remember a great night drinking draft porter in uh, in Myrtle Beach. One of the few things that made being in Myrtle Beach uh, bearable <laughs> at that point. Um, I just, I really like the style. And, uh, you know, when he asked me to write it, I was like, absolutely, I'll do that. Let's let's go. That's great. And, and, and Todd, I, I, one reason I invite John is because I know you've made a lot of little beers and session beers. And uh, w- what's your take on Porter? Um, I'm kind of with Lou as far as uh, gravitating more towards uh, Porter as, as uh, my drink of choice of the two. So, yeah, we make, a lot of small beers. Um, we actually have a 4% English style porter that I make every six to eight weeks. Um, I also make a uh, petite stout pretty often. It's basically a dry Irish stout, but I wanted it to be a little bit lower in alcohol uh, than the BJCP calls for. So it's like 3.5, 3.6%. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, our English porter is probably one of my favorite beers uh, to drink. You know, it, it it doesn't have any roasted malt. It's got uh, some nice brown malt. It's, I don't know, it's something I really want to go back for. And even though I like that petite stout of ours, it's it's kind of acrid and has a lot of coffee flavor. It's, it's a little more, I wouldn't call it more standoffish, but it's not something I could just sit around and drink when the weather is, uh, you know, kind of mild. 
You know what I mean? That uh, definitely sounds like you've got a good differentiation there. I love that. Yeah. Keep going, Don. Well, I actually wanted to say, you know, I haven't met you, Lou, um, yet, but I want to extend an apology because oh, no. Uh, no, no, seriously, I uh, we make a uh, a summer ale now, and I had just released a second batch of that, and I don't know where I saw it, Lou, if it was in your Facebook or Twitter, and you were like, I forgot, you said it was pretty good or whatever, but you said it was um, that it was too light and it wasn't balanced, and I was quick to defense. And thinking that you had the second batch, because the first batch was super dry. It was like 2.1 finishing gravity, and it was out of balance. But the second batch was like, I'd say, you know, in my opinion, like really nice. But it was like 2.6, 2.6 Play-Doh. And I'm like thinking that's what you had. And then I look back, and I was like, fuck, he did, he's drinking the original. He's fucking right. And uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to, and that's Dude, why you I you apologize like, or thank or say anything you want to after that. You're, yeah, <laughs> no, no. That's real. all good. So, so I, that's the reason I wanted to be on the show to say, I'm sorry, you were right. It was too dry. But that second batch was the only one I've, I've brewed it now t- two more times. I've been trying to mash higher and, and all this, but the, the beer just wants to finish a little bit lower. Um, I like it as far as drinkability goes, but I feel like it, it doesn't quite strike that balance because it's got 13 pounds of, uh, you know, low alpha hops in there. And, uh, you know, so for a small beer as it is, four point, you know, two percent or whatever, um, it's bitter, you know, and I like that. But as far as like striking a perfect balance, it does not. And you were uh, you were dead on. So anyway, I just want to say uh, thank you for the feedback. And I'm sorry I was wrong. You were right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, I'm actually drinking a bigger porter than you. I've, I've been a huge fan of Baltic porters for a long time, like actually longer than I've been at this. I, I think I had my first Baltic porter in like 93. Um, oh, wow. And I have one from uh, Urban Roots out in uh, Sacramento. Uh, Peter's a, a good friend. We we met judging at GABF and stayed in touch. And he sends me beer every now and then. So I have the uh, Geeks of the Industry Baltic Porter that he does. Um, real good beer. I mean, he's <laughs> he knows I like them, so he sends me those in every box. <laughs> nice. I love a good Baltic Porter. Yeah. Lou, one thing I liked about your article is that is that you you really did – you open the window to talking about it and t- tell us about the, the history of, of porters in, in, you know, your words. Well, um, I mean, <laughs> I read the same stuff everybody else was reading in the late eighties and early nineties. And I can pretty much just chuck that all out the window. Um, thanks to, uh, research scholarship by people like, uh, Martin Cornell and Ron Pattinson, particularly, you know, people who dig into the uh, the old documents, the old uh, brewing records. Um, and in Martin's case, I mean, Martin just tries to find almost everything that was published in that era and not just brewing stuff. I mean, you know, he's looking for mentions of, of beer in, in early newspapers, in, in books, in, in fiction. Um, and what he came out with and what Pattinson essentially backs up with numbers from the breweries is that what we used to think was the story of Porter just isn't so, um, that Porter was, uh, some kind of new beer that was developed, uh, to, to substitute or to take over from, uh, the practice of blending beers. And that's why it was called entire Porter that was all done in one, one vessel. And that was the entire thing. And it it turns out that that's um, the first kind of mention of that kind of thing comes 70 years after Porter appears. Um, and <laughs> in the intervening 70 years, Porter had become the biggest style of beer being sold in, in England. And as, uh, as Cornell put it, uh, you know, it seems kind of hard to believe that nobody would have gotten credit for inventing the most popular beer in, in England. And, you know, as he said, it's probably just that it evolved. And he, his um, reading is that it evolved from brown beer, uh, from brown ale, um, that it was um, more aged, uh, you know, allowed to uh, mature more, that it was uh, more fully hopped, um, and that it was a little bit stronger as well. 
and that's I mean that's what made it popular. All three of those things would tend to make it a better beer. Um, well, I don't know about the stronger part, but um, and then uh, you know, even the whole thing about porter, um, it it goes wider than you know the the story that it was the the guys bringing stuff from the docks. It turns out that porters, I mean, essentially made everything move in London, that there were over 5,000 of them and they had their own guild. And um, there are, uh, and again, quoting Cornell, um, they, you know, I mean, a, a heavy manual labor or somebody who's, you know, all day long working and carrying and farming and, you know, blacksmith, whatever, somebody like that will do four or 5,000 calories a day. And it's estimated that from looking at what they ate and drank, during, they got about 2,000 calories just from beer. So that's where you're... <laughs> uh, so I was saying, I'm glad you brought up Martin Cornell because I, I, I'm reading his book, The Amber and Black. Mm. And um, I will say... Excellent which, book. My first thought coming into this is that, wow, I think Lou's going to get into some myth busting. Because there, there, <laughs> there, there's so many myths about beer. Yeah, really, all I'm doing is is quoting Martin because he's, I mean, I got a chance to meet him and I was just, I was tongue-tied. I was just like, oh, you you know a lot, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, and, you know, no slight on the people who just repeated what we'd heard because that's what we, that's what we had. Um, but when someone comes along and, I mean, I couldn't get it at Brewery Records. And to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not too lazy to have not done it. Um, but, hey. <laughs> well, I'll Lou, you're honest. a really good editor. Put it that way, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but, uh, you know, Porter was a, a beer style that came along, exploded, um, and, you know, for over, over 120 years was a dominant beer. And then it was it had almost disappeared by the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. So let, let's jump let's jump to the 1980s craft beer in America. What was going on? Were, were brewers just like trying to just rediscover old styles? Yeah, I mean that was a lot of it. Um, and, and sometimes getting confused. I remember uh, talking to Fritz Maytag about how he wanted to make you know, what he called real beer, uh, the way it was supposed to be made, and going to um, English breweries and look at it, and he said, they weren't even using all malt. They were putting sugar in it. They were putting... <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Um, yeah, so he's like, I decided to come home and do it better. And, you know, that's the thing. You look at this, and what were they using? Well, at that time, we didn't even know what they were using in the 1700s. Um Pattinson has found some of that by doing what you do. You go to the actual brewery notebooks, which are happily for a lot of the British breweries available in uh, various uh, public libraries and, and research libraries, academic libraries. So you can actually find these things and find out what they were putting in it. Um, and a lot of these uh, different beer styles were driven by the developments of, of new malts. Um, um, Porter is not one of them. I don't. I don't mean to say that, but I mean Porter comes from uh, brown malt. Uh, but brown malt was around. Um, Porter is really more a, a development of other brewing styles. But um, so these guys in the in the early nineteen uh, eighties, seventies in in Fritz's case, um, well, I should say Mark Carpenter's place. Uh, they're looking at. Uh, what they see and, and I mean, some beer styles that are around, like there's, there were still IPAs being brewed in, uh, in Great Britain. There were still, I mean, there was a couple of porters. There was the Sam Smith. Um, and oddly there was the um, Baltic porters that nobody paid any attention to, even though they were, you know, they were being made this whole time. Nobody took a look at them. Uh, the Yingling Porter, which was a, some kind of, I mean, Yingling, actually, uh, the Lion made one as well. It was like a lager brewed porter-ish beer. Uh, maybe even more like a Dunkel than it was a porter. But, um, yeah, they, they, they took a look at, um, you know, the salient features of some of these beers and tried to duplicate them. Uh, a lot of times, like, I mean, 
honestly kind of feeling their way through the murk, like somebody trying to walk on a foggy street. Um, didn't always have a lot of clear stuff to go on, but they wanted to brew something that tasted good. And, you know, the other thing about this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling and weaving here, but as you know, that's how things go when people talk about beer. That's why um, we invited you. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that uh, Pattinson, Ron Pattinson has always hammered on that has gotten through to me, and I'm, I, and I'm actively trying to get the people in whiskey history to, to accept it and understand it, beer is a moving target. You know, it doesn't stay the same, you know, and all you have to do is look at what IPA is now and look at what IPA was 30 years ago, you know, um, 30 years ago, an IPA now we'd think of what was an IPA 30 years ago as eh, pale ale, maybe kind of, um, you know, they were five and a half to six and a half percent. They were maybe 50 IBU and you know, that's completely changed. And that's not even getting into hazy IPAs and um, cold IPAs and, you know, all the other session IPAs, all the varieties of IPA that we have. Um, things change. And, uh, you know, Pattinson was always saying, well, you know, you, you say you want to make brown ale the way it used to be. Used to be when? <laughs> you know, and I mean, Cordell points out that there were, I think he says there's, I can't remember if he said four or five, like, different porters that were all called porter. They were all called London porter. They were all made in London. But over the period of 140 years, what they were changed because people's tastes change. You don't want to always have the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that, Lou, that, that's a great thing to say what is porter and what does it mean to people? Because honestly... I can't tell you the name, but for six years until recently, I lived two doors down from McSorley's Ale House in New York City. Yeah. And they, you know, they have a, a light and a dark. Well, one day I saw the keg delivery, and I can tell you that I know what the dark was for a couple of years. And I'll <laughs> only say that it was a porter. So although uh -huh. it may it may have changed since then. So um just just food for thought. But but Todd, for I you, I got to tell you that that talking. light and dark labeling has always been some of the most honest <laughs> ones out there. I really shouldn't talk about, it, but I can just tell you that it's a highly coveted, <laughs> highly coveted placement, and the, even the sales reps who who, who get that account uh, are not supposed to say that their beer is there. <laughs> so um, they're very. It's a very great operation. But for Todd too, for you making it, you know, what got you interested in these English style beers? Because I remember. You know, I got, I got to know you in the last couple of years, and um, I, I've had your porter. I, I've had some other English ales that you've made. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, coming from a brick store pub, you know, in uh, Decatur, Georgia, we always had, you know, a handful of English beer uh, available not only on draft, but in the bottle. So for me, I, I just, I've always kind of been in love with, um, with English beer, and I've really gotten into kind of what Lou was saying is like doing some of these more historical uh, styles of beers. So like you find, you know, a paragraph and it doesn't always lead to a whole uh, conceptualized view uh, of a beer, but at least you have like a fragment. And so you like, all right, I, I kind of have an idea because there's no way you're going to find a commercial example of like, you know, a Donker beer or a Shank beer or something like this. And we were lucky enough to host uh, Ron a few months back uh, he came to the pub and we did, he did a little talk with Stan Hieronymus and, you know, like you said, he, he has a ton of knowledge and has done a lot of uh, work and research on, uh, on brewing. And, you know, he's definitely a bit of a myth buster and it's fun to hear some of the stuff, but like, you know, like he was saying, a lot of it had to do, or what he said when he was here was a lot of it had to do with taxes and, you know, what was going on at the time, was there a war going on? So like, uh, Lou touched a little bit on like uh, adjuncts and sugars being used. Um, Fritz Maytag kind of knocked that, I guess. Um, I'm a fan of that. I, I actually, I think adjuncts have kind of gotten a bad uh, rap, but uh, I'm a big fan of using rice and corn and stuff like this and, and um, mashes. And, you know, we have a house dark mild, a house bitter, a house porter and um, a, a summer ale. So I brew those all the time. And so when you have that many English beers on draft, it's hard to be like, all right, I'm going to brew something new. But 
recently I did like three different collabs with some uh, retailers and I was able to make, you know, finally this corn mild. I've been wanting to make a corn mild since I read about it like a year and a half ago. And it was so soft and silky, the mouth that like, if you look at it on paper, I would say like, as far as a uh, BJCP stats, it's probably closer, closer to a, like an English, uh, English brown ale. Um, because it finished a little bit higher in, uh, in gravity, but man, it was, it was so, it was so good. And I'm not just saying it cause I've made it, but like, I thought it was better than our, our dark mild. And, uh, we're actually making a, a beer with some folks up your way, Jimmy. I pitched them on a, um, uh, corn bitter. So we're doing a best bitter with, uh, cor- corn, uh, at threes in a few weeks. And they're going to, Oh put man, in the that's amazing. Yeah. yeah they're going to put in the fooder for 30 days too. So I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to take away the uh, adjunct American lager and bring it back and, you know, make it a good thing or whatever. So I, I would kind of like to do away with the whole word adjunct. You know, yeah. They're just, yeah. Uh, they're just other grains or, yeah. I mean, or even sugars. You know? Sure, sure. And yeah, it's, totally. it's, a, it's a very judgmental word. Yeah, it is. And to that point, too, talking about stouts, like a lot of these, you know, I don't want to pick on any brewers, but people say, oh, let's what's all this adjuncted with it's like that's not a fucking adjunct bro that's a that's a spice <laughs> you add you added yeah. <laughs> uh cinnamon to a finished product that did not add any fucking sugar anyway i get a little hung up on some of those little <laughs> sillinesses but uh yes i agree adjunct is not a bad word unless you call it a sugar source yep that doesn't the word adjuncts come from like the early days of home brewing when you know like malt extract or something was what you had to work with. So te- technically, an uh, adjunct would be something added to the mash that is not, uh, you know, malted grain that adds sugar. That's technically what it is. It just gets misused by people who make stouts and uh, gets a you know the dirty word from uh, you know AB and Bev and Coors and stuff like that. Well, Lou, you you, you so we're talking about porters versus stouts. I mean, this little world of, and it's a little world of dark beer, but it's not really a little yeah. world. You know, brown, just brown ales, porters. Sometimes I'm always like, it's like buyer beware. It's like, I don't know until I taste it if I'm going to like it because there's so many variations. Well, I, I still come back to, I, I, I maybe quote this even too many times, but it just, it, it, I think it's accurate, but at the same time, it makes me chuckle. It's the Michael Lewis definition of stout from his uh brewer's publication stout book a, a stout is a dark beer that the brewer labels as a stout <laughs> because i mean otherwise you know you, you try making rules and you're like nope nope this one doesn't follow that and it's a stout no nope, that one doesn't follow that it's a stout but you know you can get people saying well is it a stout then like you know what, what's the street of porter and a stout it's almost like there's just a continuum of dark ales and your beer is somewhere along that. That's, That's a all. good one. Well, yeah. before, before the show today, I called up my my, uh, my Scots English friend Callum, who regularly has a a porter with his lunch, and I said, "I'm getting ready for the show, Callum. What's a porter?" And he was stumped, and he said, "A porter is a porter." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you like that? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I'm drinking right now is a perfect example of it. I mean, a Baltic porter was literally an attempt to imitate an imperial stout. So it's a porter trying to be a stout. And the the best part about that is originally the imperial stouts were called imperial porters. So it's it's almost like uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character in Tropic Thunder. I'm a dude imitating another dude who's acting like a dude. (laughs) <laughs> like that's that's what a Baltic porter is, you know, Lou. But about your writing and stuff. So, I mean, you 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 put in a lot of references. You just you just put in a, a film reference. So yeah. you've got references about music. Um, you know. Oh right, the Moldau thing. Yeah. Yeah. T- tell us about your writing. I mean, you've been writing for thirty years, um, and you. I love you. I mean, I love it. I, I could read your stuff all day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I joke with my my daughter about this that um, you know I I remember I was uh, binging on Breaking Bad and she's like, shouldn't you be 
like working and this is she was in a very <laughs> earnest phase at this point she's like shouldn't you be working right now i'm like i am working i need cultural references so i can write gooder i was <laughs> kidding with the last bit but um you know there's something to that i i mean i know i i keep a copy of the bible close hand because there is nothing that impresses editors more than dropping in a very appropriate biblical quote you know <laughs> um, it just sounds smart. Um, you know, and, and again, the, you know, the musical thing, I, I've tried to, um, I've tried to let my whole life inform my writing. Um, and, and I, and some of it comes out just, I mean, I've been around a lot of people who drink, so I have, I have some, some pretty good drinking stories that sometimes, can apply to, I mean, there's uh, drinking stories that, you know, nobody would really want to read about because uh, they're just drinking stories. But I mean, I had, there was one I had that was great. It was a, um, we were actually going to a, um, a Lambic festival in Belgium and we had to walk about half a mile to get to the fest and it was dark and, you know, the sun had already gone down and the wind was blowing and it was starting to rain. And I remembered I had a flask of uh, Redbreast Irish whiskey and I got it out and started passing it around. And it was, I don't know, it was like some kind of scene out of Tolkien where an elf pulls out a, a flask <laughs> of some magic cordial. Everybody was suddenly like perked up and ready to go. And um, and I used that in my in one of my whiskey books. I, I told that story. Um, I think you just have to be, you know, there's, sorry, I'm getting way into it. Like it's like oh more, no, you're, like li- a... <laughs> you're, you're, you're livening up the show. I got some cultural <laughs> okay. references. Okay. Come on. Let um, me... No, it's, uh, you have to figure, and I, you know, when I first started writing, I wanted to put myself in the writing all the time, just out of, I don't know if it was ego or I'd seen other writers doing it. I guess it was uh, like seeing Hunter Thompson do it. But since then, I have realized that the best way I can put myself in my writing so it's not as obtrusive is these cultural references that are are things that I have read or seen or heard or done. And I mean, the Moldau thing just, I, honest to God, it almost came to me unbidden. I'm like, this is like those two themes that blend into one and make a bigger thing. And I ran with that. Um, you know, I, and I, I know there are, uh, I, there's a whiskey writer I know that um, has also been a, a music writer for many years, and he will throw um, some really almost obscure album references in, and I'll go and look them up. I'm like, oh my god, that's exactly right. That's that's dead on the money, and you know, it, it would probably be better if I don't know if they were more accessible references or if I knew more. But on the other hand it's kind of cool that I went and looked and it was there. Cause we can go and look now. That's another thing, you know, it can find all this stuff on the internet now. Um, but yeah, I just like to, um, I like to make the, the writing a, a story. This is what I'm always uh, telling people when I'm interviewing them, especially like the publicity people for a brand. They always want you to write just a, Oh, here, here's the, what we need you to put I'm like, Oh, okay. First off, it's not going to be a story about your brand. It's going to be a story about this stuff and your brand is going to be part of it. Because if I just write a story about your brand, no one's going to want to read it. You know, they're <laughs> going to, they're going to look at that and they're like, Oh, P- puff piece. He was paid to write that. I want to get a good story and you're part of it. Isn't that good enough? It's more natural. You're going to look better anyway. So, I mean, that's always, that's always what I want to do. I want to find us. I want to find a story. And in this case, um, you know, Danny kind of handed me the idea for the story on a on a plate and said, "What do you think of this one?" He actually he actually handed me like four ideas. I'm like, no, "This one, this one here." The full at so, the full full pint at the full pint, yeah. Dot com. Hey, Danny to, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back in a few minutes, and Todd's going to add Lou ask Lou questions, and Lou's going to ask Todd questions <laughs> on Beer Sessions Radio. All right, woo. I'm Chava Peribán, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN, here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family-owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. 
Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability managed forests. 81A is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhattan, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. HRN is home to transformative exchanges about food. We hope our diverse lineup of shows opens your eyes, educates, and empowers. I spent seven years working in the restaurant and bar industry in front of house and back of house. And I just feel like Heritage Radio Network's content helps me feel so well connected to the other creators and chefs and restaurateurs and all the amazing things that they're doing. I still feel like I get to be a part of the kind of in team. Join us during our summer membership drive by donating and becoming a member. Members play an essential role in keeping nonprofit food radio on the air. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to become a member today. We thank you for your support. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Join us, become a member, support us at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. It's a nonprofit radio network, now a podcast network uh, with over 30 shows weekly, but everything from food, farms, cocktails, beer, cider, and more, heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. So Lou and Todd, we're talking about porters, but a lot more. Now let's just do the writer life thing, okay, since you're on that, Lou. I like this. <laughs> so what about the role of writer as critic since – since that's the only reason why Todd came on the show today. Wow, yeah. Um, I mean, it's an it's an interesting angle. I, I, you know, people are like, so you taste beer for a living? No, I'm like, no, I don't really, um, because mainly nobody really wants to hear what you have to say. Um, you know, they'd they'd much rather go to uh, Untapped uh, and do it themselves. Uh, maybe see what a bunch of other people said about it. Um, not many people are really interested in. Uh, well, I, I gotta say, not many publications are interested in paying for tasting notes. Um, a little bit more for whiskey, but I think that's mainly because, uh, you know, a bottle of whiskey can be a, a, a major investment as opposed to a, a bottle or even a, a case of beer. Um, so I think people are a little more interested in that, but, um, there's not, not so much, uh, people want to know about that. Again, I think it's, it's more people want to hear stories. That's a good one. Hey, Todd, and for you, um, you're you're in the cusp, in the middle of everything. Apparently, tonight you've got John Hall, one of our mm. favorite writers at Good Word Brewing, and you had Ron Pattinson there not too long ago. Um, you That's say, a great program you're running. Yeah, say anything about <laughs> yeah, beer writers? Yeah. Or? yeah, so, yeah, I got a lot, actually. So, uh, John... <laughs> John is awesome. He said to tell you guys hello. Uh, and he, he mentioned your uh, your pint. Uh, I forgot how he phrased it, but he said to ask you about your pint, uh, Lou, your pocket pint, I think you referred to it. But it sounds oh. like you're, you, you, let us, you let us know already. Um, but it's funny, as you were talking, Lou, and uh, Jimmy had mentioned something about uh, Critic and, and, and talking about beer. Uh, I feel so close to the source for our beer, and that's probably why I got defensive when i first saw whatever lou had written because you know obviously one of the owners here and then i'm the guy that makes the beer but i'm also the one who like runs the social media so it is hard not to <laughs> sometimes be like oh my god because like like you guys said untapped is kind of the driving force for like unfortunately I, and i really don't give a shit if untapped here is this fuck untapped um <laughs> but they they Sorry. uh it's <laughs> It reminds me of the Ouroboros, or however you say that, the snake eating its own tail. Oh, because yeah. what, what's happened is this great homogenization of like beers and breweries and retailers. Because what happens is these 
uh, untapped scores drive the consumer because that's what, and it drives the uh, producer, us, because, um, you know, they are like, we only want scores of this high threshold, right? And so then that's what you see when you go to a bar and that's what you see when you go to a, a brewery and that's what people want. So for us, now don't get me wrong, I make hazy beers and I make uh, fruit sours and I do uh, silly stouts. But if you look at my list, and John was saying it earlier, we literally left his podcast and I ran up here to do this one. Uh, but um, our list has probably 16 beers on it right now. And I'd say 90% of those are, uh, you know, English beer and, and lagers. And if not, they're sub 5% beers. So even though I look at untapped, if I want to get a little depressed, um, <laughs> I, I don't let it dictate how I run this business. Um, meaning like, you know, I'm, I'll be 43 in December and I started in craft beer in 2005. I've, I've only been brewing for um, about six, seven years. And, and two of that was um, a home brewer. So that being said, even though my career is short as far as the brewer, um, I've got a lot of pride in what I do. And so, you know, maybe it's a detriment that I'm also the one that runs like the social media uh, part of it. But um, anyway, so. It's kind of going to be rough having that right in your face. You know, you're yeah, the guy who's yeah. got to respond to the Yeah, it, it can be. But, you know, and also do like the Google reviews and stuff like that, too. And I don't know, man, I try to remember the end of the day. It's only beer. But, oh, I was going to say this. So <laughs> you talked about uh, Jimmy mentioned writers and all kind of stuff. So writing is like in my, in my blood. So for me, um, I've always kind of connected with writers. I was in a band for a long time and I was a senior songwriter. My grandfather wrote for the, uh, AJC and he was a um, speech writer for Jimmy Carter. Um, so like, well, what's, what's AJC? Oh, I'm sorry. Atlanta journal constitution. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And he was a sports writer for a long time. His name was Bill Robinson. But anyway, so I've, I feel like writers like Lou and like Ron uh, Pattinson, Stan Ryan, John Hall, um, Kate Bernat, uh, you know, even now as kid, like these guys have this like credibility. And I, that's one of the things I do is, you know, I send a lot of beer to writers. I'm like, you know, I don't ask, hey, put this in the thing, you know, to Lou's point, I don't want it to be a fluff piece, but like if, Lou's asked, like, hey, do you have any good English summer? I was like, yeah, I had one. It was good. It was probably a little too fucking dry, but it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, instead of uh, spending a bunch of marketing money to do untap and paying them for whatever the hell they would do for us, I'd rather send beer to um, beer writers than let it happen, like, organically. So if, like, you know, again, somebody likes what we're doing and they write a piece that, you know, it can involve like small beers in some way. And they're like, also good word, uh, brewing in public house. And it was Georgia does this little beer event and it's only lagers, you know, whatever that ties it back in because, you know, it's like just you said, so it's many, more organic. It's just more totally. believable. Yeah. And there's, so, totally, and there's so many stories out there and people, our attention spans have just gotten shorter and shorter. So, but, uh, yeah, fuck on tap. That's good. Hey, uh, Lou, um, keep going. Uh, for you, your career, editor and writer, wh which do you prefer? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I really enjoy editing. Just, I mean, the actual, uh, like, getting my fingers into a piece. And, I mean, some of the some of the best moments I've had in this career have been when, uh, you know, writers have said, well, you made me really, you really made me sound better there. Um, and I mean, I remember one uh, writer, he's, I mean, established writer, he's been at this longer than I have. And I took his piece and I, I remember all I did was take three three paragraphs out of the middle and put them at the front because it was a better lead than, than what he had written. <laughs> and I was, I mean, it was practically all I did. And he came back, he's like, you're right, thanks. That's really good. Of course, on the other hand, I remember... <laughs> I remember Steve Beaumont one time saying, you really are a good editor because you knew right how to find the heart of my piece and cut it out. Like, yeah, okay, all right, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, the, um, the minutia of editing, you know, the scheduling and all that crap, yeah, hate it, hate it. The, I mean, the, the working with the writers part, that's great. I really love it. I mean, I've, I've, I've helped, uh, I've helped develop some writers. Uh, I mean, Fred Minnick, uh, who's a, you know the big name in whiskey writing right now, 
Fred's like, yeah, I mean, you taught me how to how to write in because Fred was a newspaper writer before. And I mean, I remember the first couple of pieces he sent to us, they all had these like two sentence long paragraphs, like burp, 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 burp. And I'm like, have a longer thought, you know? And that's, sometimes that's all it takes. And, uh, you know, that got better. I, I've been I've been lucky enough. I've uh, mentored uh, a number of uh, women into the field. And uh, I'm actually working with a... Uh, uh, a new organization that's um, helping uh, women get into uh, whiskey writing, and I'm and I'm like an official mentor now, which is really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I like doing that part. I, yeah, writing. Um, you know, some some days it's good, some days it's not. Uh, I just did uh, like four pieces in the last week and a half, and three of them were a lot of fun, and one of them was a slog. It happens. Well, when, when you write well, you make me thirsty. That's all I can say. <laughs> now back that's to the, Porter. That's so, the best thing to hear. <laughs> so you, you, you listed a couple of Porters that you recommended. Because, again, it's like, what is Porter? As, yeah. as Callum says, a Porter is a Porter. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I, I actually do have some Deschutes. So I have Deschutes Black Porter. Classic. But it's 5.5%. Um, you know, is that a, like a classic American porter? Was that the category you'd put it in, Lou? I, I think so, yeah. Because, I mean, that's what my, um, I mean, my local brew pub uh, down the hill here, Elk Creek Cafe, um, I mean, they always have a porter on. They always have a brown on. They always have a pale ale and a copper. Um, and, uh, and actually, they always have an English uh, hopped IPA on as well. But the porters, I want to say 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, and that's... You know, I mean, I think that's that's America. Um, some people expect that they do run uh, some uh, lighter beers uh, in in the rotate. They have three rotating taps. Well, four, excuse me, four rotating taps, um, and they'll run some some lower alcohol beers there. But um, yeah, you know, this is like my um, struggle to get session beers going. Americans just didn't want to do it. You know, they just seem to think that anything under 5% was a cheat. Um, craft beer drinkers, that is. Um, and now, you know, that that shifted now with the, I don't know what the hell the, the window is called. I can't remember the, the term. Um, but um, that acceptability has changed. And now we're, you know, somebody like Todd can make and sell a beer regularly that's, four percent or less i mean notch up in massachusetts uh chris loring is you know not just making a living he's making a name for himself brewing stuff that's four and a half and under so chris, chris is awesome uh, yeah i yeah. love chris he's he's great i've only had a uh, chance to meet him once we were actually just emailing uh he makes fucking amazing beers great i gotta great tell guy. you talking beer with chris is is some of the oh god some of the, some of the best hours i've had in my life He's a good one. We did a couple of shows with him, one about the, his pitch line pills. Todd, Todd, for you, and since we're talking session beers, tell us a little more about the Little Beer Fest. Um, and what, what were some of the beers that stood out for you, like the the ABV and which ones are were memorable for you? So we've done a Little Beer uh, two years now. The first year we did it, and it's right here in our little town grain. Um, and uh, downtown Duluth, it's a great little setting for we have a outside amphitheater, we have a band and all that kind of stuff. But um, first year we did it in June, and it was hot as fuck in Georgia. And then <laughs> last year, yeah, this past year we did it in April, and you would never expect it, but it fucking snowed. It was crazy, oh like a, a light, <laughs> sleety, sleety snow. Uh, the next day, fucking beautiful, 70, uh, 40 degrees. <laughs> but uh, it's really cool, it's a really special sort of event. We we were lucky, and in 2019, Shelton Brothers, their last the festival, invited us up to Buffalo, and uh, it was amazing. We were like this little unknown brew pub. Now that we've changed much, we're still pretty unknown, but um, we were pouring <laughs> this room with all these like legendary breweries. It was fucking amazing. So I wanted, and my partners wanted to have this uh, event that was very reminiscent of that, because a lot of times you go to these beer events, and it's like, uh, it, it, you know, particularly here in Georgia, where it's just like, any brewery in Georgia can pour. We wanted to be very selective about who we're inviting 
And so I invited around um, the first year, I think we had 52 breweries and last year we had 64 breweries from around the country. And it's pretty, um, it's pretty exclusive. We, you know, we don't ask everyone to send an owner or a brewer or a high level rep or whatever, but they tend to do that. Um, and uh, the caveat is we want one pale lager and then the other beer needs to be five and a half percent or lower of any style. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's one of my favorite events. I don't actually get to drink and have fun during the event because I'm, you know, playing host, like you might imagine. Uh, and even though everything goes really well, that I have the last two years, that first half hour is a fucking doozy. Um, <laughs> but we have, uh, we, we do a beer dinner like, uh, the Thursday before. And then we have, uh, which the beer dinner, beer dinner, we basically ask, uh, you know, one of the breweries who's coming down to do a, a collab dinner with us who will have like three beers from them and three from us and it's five courses paired out and one welcome beer it's really fucking dope so we're doing we're doing a saison and mixed culture event in november um the city hasn't let me start it uh start um promoting it just yet but hopefully very soon they're meeting with the city council uh late july and they said pretty much it's going to be a done deal but we're calling it le bon which is the good um we're going to ask um uh, around 25 30 breweries um, who were just amazing saison and mixed culture um, breweries to come down, and the idea is to not only focus on those beer styles, probably a little bit of lager, but also any beer that has um, oyster as an ingredient. We're gonna have oyster south here, um, and basically, we're, it's a charitable event. So every every money that goes past paying for the event will go directly to Oyster South, which helps aquaculture in the and the, the south. <laughs> but we're trying to get like six or so oyster farms uh, down here to have uh, some shucked oysters on site. I mean, oh. if it shapes up like we're thinking, it's going to be super, you, you, super you, can't, you can't announce yet, but just for me as a friend, what's the date? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, November 5th, and uh, we already have our guest uh, collab brewer uh, come down for the dinner. That'll be that Thursday the 3rd. We're going to have a uh, Ron extract from uh, garden path and have their, nice. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. One of my yeah, favorites. One of my favorites. Wow. Well, this yeah, is I'm holding there. a, uh, a sample bottle of an oyster vodka right now. Oh dude, that uh, sounds great. Yeah. It's from a place in uh, Rhode Island, industrious spirit company. And they actually put the oysters right in the still. Fuck yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, this is really quick. I'm really happy that you guys got got talking. Yeah, I was just drinking the whole time. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, Lou, you, you're a great journalist. Why don't you ask Todd a beer question? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, I do have a question, actually. Why English styles? I mean, they're a great thing, but I mean, it's kind of a you know a, a friend of mine referred to as the uh, the commercial suicide brewery. Um, I mean, it's worked for you, which is awesome, but why? I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, like lagers have gotten pretty popular, right? We, we've been brewing lagers since uh, 2017, but I think we opened with a bitter and a mild in 2017. So it's, I don't know, I want, I want a good word to be a place that, you know, guys who are burnt out on, or anyone who, female, anyone who's burnt out on beer, craft beer, to just find something that's just easy drinking. So we want a, a place that like your craft beer enthusiast is gonna love somebody who's you know old and curmudgeon like us probably uh, to come in there and uh, and enjoy themselves. So I don't know why not English beer. I lo- I'll say this: a lager brew day. It's about ten to twelve hours. We do uh, multi-step uh, mashes and decoctions, and a lager or uh, English brew day is about five hours, so it's about half it. So. Usually we'll, we brew all our uh, English beers in like one week and they're so fast. My assistant brewer is like, we could just only brew English beer. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Why not English beer? I love it. I love it. Big well, I, I do think, you know, and to, to wrap on that, I, I, I am overwhelmingly happy that the industry has gotten big enough that we can have a place like that or that we can have a place like Dovetail in Chicago that can have three different Rauch beers on draft. I, you know, we are that big, yeah. you know, there's, there's enough breweries around that somebody can find the one that they really want to go to. Exactly, I think that's yeah. awesome. Totally. And actually while John Hall is here, we're, uh, we're making a smoked, uh, English border. So excited for that oh, one. Yeah. Well, I'll send you some. Okay. All right. Well, Hey, th- you know, th- this was soup to nuts. We went from Lou 
his article about Porter and, and Stout and um, got also to talk with Todd at Good Word Brewing in Duluth, Georgia. So thank you guys so much for joining me, Lou and Todd. Big thanks to our engineer today. It's Matt Patterson and then Armin Spingen will finish it off and Alex Tran, our producing intern. I'm Jimmy Carboni. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.